Hello and welcome listeners to the Let's Talk About Grief podcast. If you've followed or listened to previous episodes, you'll know I like to offer hope by sharing my guest stories with you. You get to hear how they have navigated their own grief, which can be both helpful and healing, knowing you too can move forward after a loss. If this is your first time and you don't know me, I'm Andy Butte, your host and author of Grief's Abyss. And this is part of my mission to help demystify grief. Hello, everyone, and so grateful you're joining us today. Once more, I am honored to introduce our remarkable guest, Kim Sorrell. She's the author of two books, a speaker whose life shows great resilience in selfless pursuit of love and light through many, many dark times. Her first book, Cry Until You Laugh, and her latest one is Love Is. It's not just a narrative about a journey that searches for the essence of love amidst profound loss. And I can't help but thinking how timely Kim we're doing this in February, the month of love, I believe. Absolutely. We'll start- <laughs> Sorry, Kim, what were you going to say? Are we going to add something there? Yeah, no, I, I think so, too. I think it's great that it's February, the month of love. I think that's wonderful. And your mm-hmm. birthday month. Oh, my goodness. You know that, too. All right. <laughs> Yeah, happy Before birthday. we get into all of that, I know we're going to dive into her books and hear more of Kim's story. But first, let me welcome Kim to the show. Welcome, Kim. Thank you for being with us and, and taking time out of your. Uh, I know you have a, a lot going on as well just to be with us. So I appreciate it. Well, I appreciate being here, Anne. I love your show. Everyone should listen to it. It gives such value, and I love what you're doing. So thank you for all that you do, and thank you for having me. Oh, that's lovely. I'll, 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 I'll accept that. I'll take it in. <laughs> you should. <laughs> thank you. Kim, when I was preparing for the show uh, today for our interview, I couldn't help but think that your journey is both personal, but it's also universal. And I'm hearing what you're going to be sharing with our listeners. I'm hearing it more and more through our guest stories that have have gone before and also the ones that are coming up. And I couldn't help but think of that book, Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? And I'm certain, Kim, you must have been thinking that yourself. You know, that's a that's an interesting thing to say, um, because I was diagnosed with breast cancer right after I was diagnosed with breast cancer. People would say to me, Kim, why you? You know, you help so many people. You do this. You do that. Why you? And my response was always, well, why not me? Like, why would I be immune? Right. I mean, cancer is random and things are random and some things are predictable. I mean, if you smoke, there's a smoker's cancer or my father died uh, not that long ago from mesothelioma and that's from asbestos in the Navy. And so there are, you know, things that you can go, gosh, that could happen to you, but otherwise things are, you know, it's just random. It's unpredictable. And so, you know, and I just don't think that there's that, that God is in heaven smiting people and saying, mm-hmm. hey, you stole that pack of gum when you were in sixth grade. So when you're 47 years old, you're getting cancer. You, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. So I think I, I think what it comes down to are people like you, hopefully people like me, that take what the crap that life throws at us, the mm-hmm. tough stuff, and turn it into a useful tool to help other people. Oh, my goodness. I love that perspective. Why not me? Because so people go the opposite way, don't they? Mm -hmm. And it reminds me of, I think it's Martin Seligman, um, his three Ps. It's personal, pervasive, and permanent. (laughs) 
<laughs> and, and it sounds that like you certainly didn't personalize it with why not me and I love that we can go into the other ones later but I just wanted to appreciate and uh, bring out that yeah these things happen and we don't always know why but I think it's how we accept the challenge mm. Yes. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So much of life, I think, is like that. And it's not so much the things that happen to us, but how we respond. And it's yeah. not even so much the things that, that we do, like when we screw up or whatever, but how, how do we respond to that? You know, are we going to learn from it? Are we going to power mm -hmm. through? You know, are we going to get some good out of it, figure out what can come of it that can help other people? And so, you know, our response is up to us and everybody responds differently. And, uh, but I admire people who go through really tough things and come out on the other side and go, you know, I now know something that other people don't know and I want to share it. Yes. And that I believe is what we'll get into a little bit later on with your, your latest book. So that's what was going through your mind. And I think that can help people. Um, if they are in that situation, why I'm a good person. Why is this bad thing happening to me? So thank you for, for uh, letting the listeners sort of have a glimpse into what it was you, what was going through your mind. Now, you yourself, you mentioned you were going through your own cancer journey. That would have been your sort of loss of health, the loss of the life that you had hoped. How did you tackle that one? That was the first one, I believe, wasn't it? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, I've had lots of losses before that, but it was, uh, um, yeah, you know, you see like Lifetime movies or Hallmark movies, and you see the the people and they they go to the doctor and they sit across the desk and the doctor delivers the news, you know, and it's all solemn and you're holding your husband's hand and all of that. And then, you know, the big reveal moment after the double mastectomy when you're standing in front, they're standing in front of the mirror and whatever. And and I got a phone call um, on a Friday afternoon to find out that I had cancer and oh. it's not, it wasn't the lifetime moment. And so it, it hit me out of the blue. Like I had a biopsy, but I was in complete denial that it was even possible that it could be mm -hmm. uh, cancer. And so, um, but, but I also knew that they caught it early okay. and my chance of survival was great and mm -hmm. that medicine's come a long way. And so all those, those good things that went along with it. Okay. So it was knowing that they had caught it early that, that there was hope there and mm -hmm. it wasn't just magical thinking there was evidence as you mentioned that um, cancer uh, medicines have improved haven't they for sure so there you are going through the chemo the radiation all that good stuff yeah well surgeries mostly it was surgeries was it was it? yeah yeah yeah, double mastectomy followed by a hysterectomy because the kind of cancer I had is mm. uh, hormone. I had hormone receptors, and so then there was another surgery, and then they found bladder cancer, and then they. It was just a, a lot of stuff in a short amount of time, I guess, and then continued for a year or so of going through everything, getting through That's it. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I couldn't help thinking. You had a double mastectomy and then you had a hysterectomy. My thought was, oh, my goodness, that almost hits at the heart of what it means to be a woman, doesn't it? Did yeah, you, you know, have those sort of thoughts? Well, it's it's interesting. I had an incredible plastic surgeon who was in on the surgery when I had my uh, double mastectomy. And mm -hmm. so I didn't, um, cause I wanted to, I wanted reconstructive surgery. And so mm -hmm. I, uh, I didn't go home with nothing, I guess. Okay. And so that helped, I think a bit. And 
honestly, the hysterectomy, best surgery I've ever had in my life. I mean, they, they told me that you either get thrown into menopause. I was 47. You either, it either throws you into menopause or you skip it altogether. Mm -hmm. And you know, within a couple of days of having the surgery, you know, within 48 hours, what, you know, if you're going to go crazy and you're going to need something. Fortunately, mm -hmm. I skipped it. I got to skip menopause. So no more monthly visitor and no more menopause. Not so bad. That was pretty good. So in your case, it was a gift, a gift, and another gift. <laughs> it was, it was. And if I hadn't had the hysterectomy, they wouldn't have found the bladder cancer. So oh they found God. that early too then. So, right. So, it, yeah. Yeah. So that was a blessing. Okay, my goodness. So it started off with breast cancer, that you had the hysterectomy because of the hormones, the uh, medication you need to take, and they discovered you had bladder cancer. Oh, good Lord, it was just one cancer journey after the next. And obviously, they managed to uh, correct that and bring you back because here you are. Mm -hmm. When did you receive the next news about your husband? Well, I, my husband started having stomach pains uh, about the time that I was diagnosed, right after I was diagnosed. And he went to the doctor and the doctor said, oh, it's nerves, you know, because of what Kim's going through. And then two months later, he went to the doctor again and was told the same thing, but got an appointment with a gastro specialist. Mm -hmm. And his appointment was the day before my hysterectomy. And I was also having a colonoscopy. So I couldn't leave my home. If you've ever had a colonoscopy, you don't go far from your bathroom. And mm -hmm. so I, I didn't go with him to the doctor. And he came home from the doctor and that specialist told him the same thing, take some Rolaids and whatever. I was so frustrated because it was four months. I mean, we've, we've been waiting for this appointment from November to January. Mm -hmm. Finally, he got in and then this is what he got. You know, the doctor saying, ah, it's just nerves. So the next day I had my surgery and then of course they found the bladder cancer. So it was a little bit more of a recovery and a little bit more extensive. And, mm -hmm. and then um, a week out, I was still in pajamas in bed watching Grey's Anatomy reruns. And my husband woke up in so much pain. And, and I said, you know what, that's it. Like, go to the hospital, go to the emergency room, at least they'll run a test, they'll do something. So yeah. he drove himself to the emergency room. And then he, uh, I'm waiting for him to call. Mm -hmm. And it took forever before he called. And then he finally called. And he said, ah, I guess they're going to keep me overnight. And I'm like, keep you overnight? They don't keep anybody overnight. Like, what is that about? So I put through on clothes, hopped in my car and in my Vicodin induced state, drove like a crazy woman to get to the hospital. And I was almost there and my phone rang again. And he said, I guess there's a spot on my liver. I'm mm -hmm. like, spot on your liver. Oh my word. I, I, I remember running into the hospital, holding all parts of me and and being told where he was, and I got to where he was, and I'm sobbing at this point, and I whip back the curtain, and he's sitting on the edge of the bed like nothing is happening. And mm -hmm. he said, listen, I am not going to invite you out anymore if this is the way you're going to behave. <laughs> and I said, listen, buddy, you are not allowed to be funny right now. <laughs> so that was the beginning of his diagnosis. He was uh, admitted into the hospital and spent a few nights in the hospital. And they, they ran tests and then it took um, nearly a week uh, when we got the final diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. So here you are in the midst of your own journey and you're thrown into your husband's very um, dire diagnosis by the sounds of it mm -hmm. yeah pancreatic cancer is is you know when he was stage four which is very typical by the time it's found it's usually so far gone and um and spread and it was with him it was definitely all over and uh so they the there's kind of no hope um which you hate to say that anything's hopeless but 
with this particular diagnosis when you're at the stage that he was at, it would be a miracle for, for him to live very long with, with that cancer. How did the two of you manage throughout all of this? Because you have children as well, don't you? Yeah, I've got five kids. And they they were all, I was 47, my husband was 51, and my kids were all grown. Um, I got a son in the Navy, U.S. Navy at the time, and um, other kids that were wherever they were, uh, one in college, maybe a couple in college, and a couple working. And um, so they were they were kind of spread out a little bit. I had a couple in town, but uh, others out of town. And um, it was... So, so it was my husband and I, you know, it was the two of us and mm. to, to digest the information was one thing, right. To get through the, yeah. the sucker punch that it was, but then to, to live with it, to live mm. with it. And our attitude leaving the doctor's office, I, I do believe in an afterlife. I believe in heaven and my husband too. And so we just prayed that either, a miracle here, you know, like, like you did the blind and the lame and the deaf, you know, a miracle here or the ultimate miracle that is heaven, but please don't let him suffer. Our prayer was that, that he wouldn't suffer. Mm -hmm. And so we, uh, we were just home together. He just wanted us to be together, which of course I wanted to. Mm -hmm. And, um, like he didn't even want me to go to the grocery store like nothing, like we were together and we didn't know if it'd be a year. We were told probably a year, you know, whatever, but you have no idea. You, mm -hmm. you just have no idea. And there were times that I would just start crying and mm -hmm. uh, he would just hold me. And then he'd say, don't cry for me. Mm -hmm. You know, don't cry for me. I, I know where I'm going. You're the one that has to stay here. And, and so um, we had a great six weeks together. We played cards and we watched cash cab and we watched some football and we, we just had a great six weeks together. And then, and he didn't suffer. We had mm -hmm. great hospice care and he didn't suffer until he woke up on a Sunday morning and uh, I called the hospice nurse cause he was in pain. And it was the, the first time because he had, he had um, uh, morphine so mm -hmm. he could, you know, keep himself out of pain and um, without getting, you know, loopy or whatever. Yeah. But then all of a sudden the morphine wasn't doing it for him anymore. And so she came over and and she's on the phone in our bedroom as I'm holding him from behind. He was sitting on the edge of the bed because uh, it was it hurt to lay down and mm -hmm. I'm holding him from behind so he doesn't fall off the bed. And she's on the phone saying, you know, getting a hospital bed. We didn't have any hospital equipment. We didn't have anything. We were just living our lives. Yeah. And and I said, gosh, do I call my kids? You know, like, what do I do? Like, is this, what, mm -hmm. you know, what's happening? And she said, oh, no, no, you've got lots of time. You've got lots of time. No worries. Don't worry about it. And then I just felt his agony. And I said, are you sure? You know, like, should I call my kid? No, no, no. If you're fine, you're fine. Well, I, I could just feel his pain. I could just feel the, his pain. So I just, I whispered in his ear and I just said, baby, just go. And that was it. So you gave him permission to go. Yeah. Yeah. Which, uh, you know, who, who wouldn't? I mean, you don't ever want to see the people that you love. You don't want to see anybody in pain, but especially the people that you love the most in the world, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, to see him in that agony, to know that he was just in pain, uh, right? It was it was certainly the right thing to do. And I think anybody would have done the same. Yeah. Unfortunately, I've seen the reverse of that, Kim, where people will go to the nth degree to keep their loved one alive regardless and I often wonder if it's they're protecting themselves from the pain of their loved one dying, that they do that. So I can't help but admire your strength and being able to let, let him go like that and not want to see him suffer anymore. Mm. 
That is remarkable. Yeah, well, you know, I, I, I think that's true. But, but you know how you see people linger sometimes? Yeah. And, and it can be for a few weeks even or longer. And, um, and it's not living, it's lingering. Yeah. And uh, I don't know, I just, um, I had to make a decision similar with my father um, just a couple years ago. My husband has been 14 years. My dad uh, died in 2016, but it seems like it was just, you know, last year. Yeah. But um the, kind of a similar thing where he was just in pain. He and and there was no hope for a cure. You know, I think yeah. that makes a difference too. Maybe as if people are holding on to hope for a cure and thinking something, you know, will happen mm -hmm. um, instead of uh, coming to grips with that there are some things that we just don't have a cure for yet. Yeah, and even the patients themselves, they all go. It's not just the the families, it's the person themselves will hold out. And I think it's just they're so scared of what's next. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that that's true. Going like that. Yeah. I'm so grateful that you were able to shut the world out and just be with each other. That had to have created some amazing memories and wow, what intimacy for the pair of you, because I'm sure you had many chats, eh? Mm -hmm. we, we did. We did. But, you know, it's interesting is he never wanted to talk about the end. He never wanted to talk about uh, what life was going to be like for me after or, you know, life for him. You know, he didn't ever want to talk about that. We talked about the kids. We talked about a million things. We talked about, you know, everything else. But... We never had a conversation like that. But part of it was, I think, too, that the doctor told us he was my husband was six foot three and 175 pounds. He was fit. He was very active. He ate great, although he did think that donuts were the fifth food group. So I don't know how good that is for you. <laughs> but otherwise, he was a very healthy eater and um, and he was fit and strong and young 51 and and so the doctor said you know if, if somebody lives a year after a pancreatic cancer diagnosis that's considered uh, a victory to live mm -hmm. a year after a diagnosis and it, but but he said but you could live longer you could you could certainly beat the odds because you're young and you're fit and you know all the reasons and um so within 6 weeks we never expected 6 weeks you know we never expected that it was going to be that fast. And, and I do believe it was so merciful for him mm -hmm. because he didn't suffer and, and until the very end there. And, and so it was incredible mercy. Uh, but I, I don't know if we would have gotten farther down the road, if we would have started having those conversations or, or what, but uh, we, we just, we didn't, we didn't have any of those. Yeah, I think you mentioned you just lived each day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. What right. an outlook. Looking back, that was a lot of grief, grief for your own journey. But then on, on top of your husband's journey, what was his name? I don't think Steve. I ever asked. Steve. Yeah. And I would imagine you would have sensed Steve's reluctance not to want to go there. So you possibly held off those conversations. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. You know, he, he, I could tell it's not anything that he wanted to talk about. I, I just wanted to kind of take his cue. Yes. And because uh, he was the one going through what he was going through. Right. right. And so um, since he never brought up anything, I just never brought up anything either. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I wanted it to be on him in what he was comfortable with. Yeah. Oh, wise woman. So now that you're on the other side, you've got some space. If you were to look back, what do you wish you had known 
about grief, about the journey? Oh, my word. Uh, I I knew hardly anything, to be honest, about grief. Yeah. I was so blind going into grief. There's so much that I wish I would have known. Uh, however many years it would have been before that, if he was 51, 20 years, 25 years before that, something like that, 20 years before that, my my mom um, actually um, died uh, by suicide, which is a whole different grief and a whole yeah. different thing to deal with. And uh, and, and so this was dealing with my husband. I just, there were so many things I didn't know. I did not know about brain fog. I thought I was losing my mind. I thought there was something wrong with me. Yes. And, and I tried to also be so strong for my kids. Like I, I had to put on a tough face. Like I had to, you know, forge ahead and I still had to deal with my medical stuff yes. and, I had to figure out this new life. And I, uh, there was just so many things all at once that I wish that I would have stopped mm. and let myself grieve. And in a way I couldn't um, because I still had to go to the doctor all the time. I was still dealing with my stuff, yes. uh, which it would have been nice to not have had to deal with that. But, mm. but I did. And then uh, but I wish that I would have been able to have time that I wish I would have, I wish I would have known, um, some of the, the things that you go through while you're grieving that you think are physical or you think are, are mm -hmm. something other than grief. You know, you're like I said, like, I thought I was losing my mind. Like, why can't I remember anything? Yeah. Why is my brain so foggy? Why, you know, why am I having a hard time getting up in the morning? I, I knew nothing. I knew nothing going into it. And so I'm experiencing those things with, with no form of reference whatsoever. And mm -hmm. so they hit me, I think, harder than had I known, hey, this is normal. Yeah. You know, sometimes you just want to know that other people are going right. through the same thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. Um, grief brain is something tend not to talk about it as much, but I think it's something that needs to be uh, uh, out there and explained. Um, it's a little bit like for women who have had children, they call it mummy brain, where they think uh -huh. there's something wrong with them. Well, grief has a similar effect on the body. It's, there's so much going on that I won't go into the science behind all of that, but the mere fact that you're unable to remember anything. Did you consider that the grief, the, the sort of foggy brain may have been the medication if you were on any medication for your cancer that was causing yeah, that? Right. No, I, I wasn't on medication. And so it, it wasn't, it was, it was, uh, it was definitely, that um it was it was grief i know that it was grief and and then after losing my dad and i still didn't know that what i was experiencing with my husband that that was normal that that was part of grief i had no idea and then several years later when my when my dad passed away um i went through i i think maybe even more intensely because mm -hmm. i didn't probably deal with all the grief after my husband passed away yeah and yeah Grief is very patient. It will wait and wait, and it will it will come out at some point. So you mentioned the physical aspects of grieving. That had to have been probably quite scary for you because you may have thought, well, is this my cancer returning? Well, I just I just thought, gosh, am I what am I missing? You know, is there something going on with me physically? Is there something I should be going to the doctor for? You know, what, what am I missing? Or am I not handling things the right way? Like I was judging myself for how I was handling it. And, and that's one thing I wish that I could take back is nobody should ever judge anybody's grief. You shouldn't ever judge your own. You know, it's going to come to you as it comes to you. And then let other people grieve how they grieve. You know, there's sometimes you hear people say, well, you know, it's time to move on. Well, mm -hmm. no, it's not. No, don't tell someone it's time to move on or get over it. No, you, those are not the things to say to somebody who's grieving. People yeah. have to go through their own grief journey. 
And uh, and I didn't fully go through mine until after my dad died. And um, which, you know, but one thing that I did discover and that nobody ever told me about this about grief, and I don't know how many people still know this about grief, but when I was able to physically go back to work, mm-hmm. I wasn't sure what I was going to do. I ended up deciding I was going to be a part-time bookkeeper for a nonprofit organization my father and I had started uh, 10 years before then. And um, so I started out January 1, the next year, part-time bookkeeper. 12 days later, there was an earthquake in Haiti that killed 200,000 people. So within days after that, I was in Haiti. And then for the next several years, I was in Haiti at least part of every month. Mm -hmm. And so I discovered that service is the greatest healer. Service is an incredible healer for grief. And I never heard any, I've still never heard anybody say that, Mm -hmm. but I believe that it's absolutely true because at some points in your life, you need to get out of yourself a bit and go serve other people. And when you do that, whether you're grieving or not grieving, the things that it does for you are all positive and wonderful. But then in the middle of, grief to do it uh, just seemed more profound. Like I really felt like that was a turning point for me in, in my journey that I was taking at that point. So that could all be almost be one of the gifts that people share about their grief journey. Yes. What you say is so, so true. And if people can allow themselves time to grieve, but then get out there and find an, a way to give back. And it may be to, uh, uh, you know, any of the grief groups. It may be do what you did, volunteer, because it's seeing others in their suffering helps you see, well, perhaps mine isn't quite as bad. I mean, you would have seen some horrific things, people losing their entire livelihoods in the earthquake, families. So it probably snapped you back into some kind of reality, did it? I I think that that's true. I think for sure that's true because there there wasn't time uh, to think about my loss, my grief, because that is what I was witnessing. I was witnessing... uh, um, people having limbs a- amputated on the mm-hmm. on the table on a, a dining room table um, mm-hmm. because there there wasn't room uh, in any of the hospitals and there's only so many hospitals there anyway and it's in Port-au-Prince, a city of two million people with infrastructure for forty thousand. I mean, it just it's crowded and so many people died and they're still getting people out that are buried and then they're trying to figure out what to do with the bodies. I mean, it was just everything. And there wasn't anybody in Haiti uh, that didn't, wasn't close to somebody that died. You know, everybody had family members, friends that they lost. And um, so they're dealing with, with intense grief, losing their home, losing family members, losing everything, losing a limb, losing, you know, it's loss, 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 all piled on together. And um, talk about a grief journey, my, my word. Yeah. Yeah. it's now become a cultural everybody in in that place it's a it'll be ancestral trauma that will continue for many many generations unfortunately and mm. you were there providing what you could support and help for these people what a beautiful story that you were able to participate in in the midst of your own grief. I just want to speak, I want to touch on your books because they're both interesting. You mentioned your mum died by suicide. Was mm-hmm. that in amongst all of the challenges you were facing or was this sometime before? Right. Yeah. No, it was, it was sometime before it was, um, how many years would it have been? 17, 18 years, 18 years before, uh, is when my mom passed away. And were you able to deal with the grief then, or was it just a mystery to you even then? Well, you know, so much of the, this 
things were the same. Like the, I couldn't think for the longest time. I had a hard time. I felt like I had a hard time thinking and so worried about my dad. And um, that played into it too. And, but uh, it, and, and it left so many questions. Yeah. You know, so, so much of, you know, what could I have done? How could I have stopped it? Why didn't I know, you know, all, all of that along with, you know, why did she, and why would she leave my kids? You know, she's a great grandmother. She was a wonderful grandmother. And, and um, so it hurt my kids and, and it's, it's just the the toughest way to lose somebody, I yeah. I believe because yeah. because of the questions that that it leaves. Exactly, you almost feel guilt for things that you may have said or didn't say, or what you may have been able to have do, done had you have known. How did you come to terms with that? Just reconciling that in your mind. Yeah, well, my mom and I were close. We spoke every day. And um she was my mom was an alcoholic. Okay. And alcohol certainly played a part in the whole thing. And mm -hmm. she uh didn't want to admit that she was an alcoholic. She never did admit it. She never went for help. She never, you know, tried to give it up. She never anything. She just drank all day every day. And uh, so, um, I don't know if it was, if she was in pain over something and that, that, that masked it, mm -hmm. certainly she had the gene, you know, the addictive gene. Mm -hmm. And, um, so it was, it was tough for her. She was a strong woman. She was a businesswoman and a coach mm -hmm. and a, you know, she was a great lady, mm -hmm. but she had also alienated people, mm -hmm. um, including my brother's. So mm -hmm. I was the only one of her kids talking to her when when she passed away. And so for me, I think it was probably actually harder on my brothers. In fact, I see the same thing with women who have lost their husbands is that I had relationship. I had a great relationship with my husband. Like mm -hmm. I have no regrets. We we had a great marriage. And uh when I meet women who have lost their husband, Mm -hmm. And they didn't have a good relationship. Yeah. They struggle more. And I think like my brothers, I think struggled more than, than I did with my mom because they had no relationship with my mom when she passed away. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're perfectly correct there. That is the hardest. There's while they're living, there's always some hope of reconciling with the person and, they're going to be the person that you always wanted them to be miraculously. Um, and there's a lot of grief around all of that. Yeah, it sounds like your mom, I believe that they're doing so much research now into alcoholism that there's, there is a pain. It's masking either insecurities um, that are real or not real, but that they believe or, or there's absolute, you know, physical abuse or, or other types of abuse. And they're just in so much pain that that helps to relieve it. And um, yeah, and I, I think that's that that is true of my mom, for sure. Yeah. That is true. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's harder to bear knowing the person had to have been in so much pain to have done what they did mm -hmm. and again not to take it personally and that's right. the hardest as you mentioned yeah yeah it definitely is and and you know it's uh man i like anything else in life you you can sympathize with people right and you can you know say, man, I feel your pain. I, I guy, that's so hard what you went through, but until you go through it yourself, yeah, you don't know the extent, you don't know what it really feels like. You can try to, but, but you don't. And so, you know, there's some people that have never lost anybody and, yeah. and haven't had to deal with any kind of grief mm -hmm. and dealing with, with suicide is it's completely different than, than anything else. And until you 
deal with it. And I pray nobody ever has to deal with it because it's, it's a tough one. It's, Mm -hmm. um, it, it's hard. My husband was, uh, really close with my mom Mm -hmm. and such a source of strength for me during that time, because he too was grieving so heavily. And so we had each other Mm -hmm. at that point, which that certainly helped, helped a lot. Yeah. That you were able to grieve together and it didn't drive you any further apart is a testament to how great your marriage was. The bonds were there, weren't they? Yeah, they were. And, you know, I think, too, when you go through times like that, it can either make you stronger or end things for you. It can drive a wedge or it can make you stronger. And if you can figure out ways to let it make you stronger. Mm -hmm then the the strength that you get from that, it, it's like, uh, you know, if you're married for 10 years compared to married for 30 years, yeah, 10 years of marriage, you you know each other pretty good. 30 years of marriage, you know each other even better, right? Yeah. And so it, it's like it, it, it accelerates the number of years you've been married, kind of, in a way, you know, like you get to a different uh, level of um, maturity in your relationship at an accelerated rate when you decide to let it grow you closer together rather than drive you apart. What helped you get through all of this? Uh, Faith, my faith for Mm -hmm. sure. And family and friends, Um, you know, people uh, service was, was huge for me. Mm -hmm. The greatest, I think that one of the greatest pieces of advice that I got after my father died, I, did decide to go see uh, a counselor. I hadn't seen a counselor. I spoke on grief. I spoke at a lot of grief share meetings, but I never did grief share myself. I never did anything about my grief. And I decided maybe it was time to see a professional. Mm -hmm. And so I went and she told me this, and I've told people this. uh, She told me to go buy a box, a pretty box at the store a wooden box, whatever, and then put things in it that reminded me of my dad, mm. you know, pictures or like he, he was in the Navy. And so there was a, um, a ceremony at his funeral. And so there were gun shells. So I had a gun shell in there, you know, just some different things. And she said, and put it on a shelf and then every day, take it off the shelf and for 15 minutes, go through the box mm. and cry Think Mm -hmm. about him, put it all back in the box and put it on the shelf again. And, you know, I did that. I went, I bought the box and I got the stuff and I put it in the box, but I never took it off the shelf because all I needed to know, what it told me was that I could grieve in chunks, Yeah, that I didn't have to experience all my grief at once because that was my biggest fear was that I, I felt like I needed to go to a hotel and just cry. And, but I was afraid I wouldn't stop. I was afraid once I really let myself grieve, it wouldn't end. And so to know that I didn't have to grieve all at once was a gift. It was, it changed everything for me. And I think that's what people are so fearful of because it is so big and so overwhelming that you're right. If you do stop, will I stop? And yes, an emotion, once you allow it, just passes through us. The grief may take, you know, an hour or so, but you, you, you're not. <laughs> you will come out the other side. And what? Thank you for sharing that with our listeners to sort of just grieve in chunks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, set a timer, yeah. even. Right. Similar right. sort of thing. What and and like yourself, allow yourself, give yourself permission yes. to do it, right? And that is another thing. I often have to give my clients permission. Mm. I give you permission to grieve. I'm sure that's true. I'm sure that's true because, it, you know, when you've not dealt with grief and all of a sudden you're having these feelings you've never had before and these thoughts and questions and whatever it is, uh, permission is probably one of the biggest things you can do is give somebody permission to grieve, that it's okay to feel the way they're feeling. It's okay to 
walk in that for a while to to deal with that. And so it's wonderful that you give people permission. Yeah. We've never had it in growing up. How many of us as child, a child was given permission to cry? We were either given something to cry about or sent to our rooms if you're of that, that generation. Exactly. It was always stop crying, don't cry, right? Exactly. Yeah. So all of a sudden we are now saying, you have our permission to cry. Mm-hmm. Kim, I want to get to your books. <laughs> Let's see how we can do this. Okay, cry until you laugh. Tell us about that. It sounds just what people may need when they're in the middle of grief. Yeah, well, I started writing after I was diagnosed with with cancer. And at first it was sort of a way to update family and friends. I'm going to the doctor tomorrow. I have surgery next week, you know, whatever it was, instead of making a bunch of phone calls. And um, but it was much more than that because I was writing about how I was feeling and what was going on. I I went to a bookstore the day after I got my diagnosis and all the books were either depressing or very medical. And I thought, well, what does it feel like? You know, what, what am I going to go through? What does it actually, do I have choices to make? You know, I don't, I don't know anything about it. And so I started writing. And so then I was still writing uh, and I would send them out in email form at the time. And before I knew it, 5,000 people were reading my emails and um, I was still writing when my husband was diagnosed and through losing him. And then, you know, through, I wrote for about a year and, uh, and I just, the, the title I just believe is true. I think you got to cry until you laugh and, and know that you're going to laugh again yeah. and it's okay to, la- and that's, I think a, per- a permission too, yes, is that it's it okay is. to laugh, right? Yeah. Cause so many feel so guilty Mm-hmm. They're no longer here, and here I am laughing. I'm having a good time. Oops, I better not. The right. guilt around all that. Yes, we could have a whole show about that for sure. So it's your journey and a your way of releasing your emotions that clearly you've written in a way that was touching others to all of a sudden have that many people wanting to read your story so it's not necessarily is the funny moments in there that you write oh, about sure. is yeah oh yeah 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 because it, you know i i don't know you you gotta you gotta find the funny in some stuff you know and so mm-hmm. yes of course there's lots of funny moments um because there are in life you know if we take ourselves too seriously it's yes harder i think you know i think um humor is is good medicine as well and so right there yes yeah I always think laughter is a way of helping the body to balance after you've had a darn good cry then Mm. have a good laugh yeah (laughs) I like that yeah (laughs) oh good now we mentioned at the beginning that February is a month of love, and it is indeed my birthday. How did you know that? I don't know, because I, I like you. I wanted to find out about everything I could about you. You're, you're wonderful. Oh, you did your research on me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. And I think that's often why I do what I do, because of when I was born. So tell us a little bit about um, Love Is. Well, you went on a quite right. the quest, and you can now, you're an authority. You found it. So share, please. Yeah. 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 Well, I wanted to make sure that I was honoring my husband the best way I could. He was such a great guy. I wanted to know that I was living life the right way. Yeah. And so I thought, well, you know, love is this thing that if you put 14 people in a room and you ask them what is the definition of love, you probably get 14 different definitions. Mm. And I thought, gosh, is why why don't we know this answer? Why don't yeah. we really know what love is and 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 how love really is supposed to work? And so I decided I would take this 2000-year-old poem, love is patient, love is kind, does not envy, does not boast, and I would take one word or phrase a month mm-hmm. and um work on it. And I dedicated a year, but the first thing I figured out is there's 14 words and phrases <laughs> in that poem. So it took me a little longer than a year. Okay. But the things I found out about love blew my mind. And the majority of the time I was in Haiti when I was working on it. And I think 
that kind of gave a different element of mm-hmm. things too, because everything's just so raw and so out mm-hmm. there that there's not the clutter of um, TV and uh, the kind of things that we clutter our minds with here in the U.S. or where wherever. Yeah. And so, so anyway, yes, it was uh, quite a journey, and um, and I know a lot about love, things that people don't know about love. Would you like to leave our listeners with just one gem that you discovered about love? Sure. Yeah. Well, one of the biggest things about love is that so often we think of love as a feeling or an emotion. Mm-hmm. And and you know how when you watch a scary movie and you go to bed that night, you hear every creak, every bump, every everything, and you're nervous and you're scared. Well, that's fear and that's an emotion. The next night you're okay, right? You, you get over yeah. the fear. You don't live in the fear. But love is not an emotion. Love is who you are. Love mm-hmm. is you, you live in love. Love isn't something you that comes and goes with the movies you watch and the people that you know, it, it is always with you. Love is always the mm-hmm. biggest part of you. It's who you are. It's not something you hang up in the coat closet when you get home or put on the back of your chair at work. It, it Love is who you are. Mm-hmm. And I think when you, when you realize that love is not an emotion, because emotions come and go. Yes. So, you know, sometimes we think that love comes and goes. Well, it, it really kind of doesn't. How you walk it is up to you. How you live it is up to you, but it's always there. Yeah. Yeah. And I love how you, you said that love is always there because too often our love is conditional, isn't it? I'll love you if, if you don't do this, I won't love you. And to me, that is so sad when you withhold that love. Yeah. Well, and, and it's not love if you have conditions on it. Exactly. You know, sometimes your love is a two-way street, right? Like that's something that we learn. I don't think it's, I think we're born probably understanding love the right way, but we're told, you know, if you, right, I'm not going to love you if you do this, or I am going to love you if you do that or whatever. And that love's a two-way street. So you're giving love to get love, but but that's not how love works. You no. love is on you, period. You have no control over what anybody else does. So you have no control over the love coming back to you. Yeah. you your only job is to love. You love you no know, regardless, regardless of what anybody else is doing. Oh my goodness. I love that definition. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. And if people want to find out more about your book. And the gems that it sounds like it's jam packed full of goodies. <laughs> yeah, I, I, th- I mean, yeah, there was so much. There's so much. Yeah, so uh, my last name is a little ridiculous. It, it has way too many letters. It's Sorrell, but there's two R's, two E's, two L's. And I'm literally the only Kim Sorrell spelled my way in the entire world. So, I'm easy to find if you know how to spell my last name, but Love Is is the name of that book. And through that book, you can find my other book. And um, my website is kimsorrell.com. And um, I love talking to people and um, I speak and I uh, I hold workshops and I hold uh, uh, retreats and um, just healing journeys on on love. So reach out. I would love it. Okay, well, we'll make sure we have all your credentials in the show notes if uh, people wish to to sort of find you. Kim, I have, uh, I know when we did the pre-interview, we had a lot to talk about. And I think today has been equally as exciting and everything that we've um, been able to bring to the listeners I truly, truly want to thank you for your wisdom, for your light that you've given to us so freely today. And listeners, I do hope that when you hear other people's shared stories of their struggles and their strength and how in community you can find your own solace, And I'll hope you will join us again 
for more stories. Until next time, I'm Anne. Bye for now. Kim, it truly has been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you. Oh, my word. Well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure for me as well. And so thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. And thank you for all you do. Well, listeners, that indeed is a wrap. Be sure to follow us by clicking on the link and you'll be the first to know when a new episode drops. And if you are feeling inspired, please leave a review. And if you are indeed grieving, please know you don't have to feel alone in your grief, but reach out. As a coach, I'm more than happy to chat with you on how coaching can both support you in your chaos and pain without forcing you to endure your grief-stricken world. You can contact me at anne at understandinggrief.com or you can visit my website at Understanding Grief. I'm Anne. Bye-bye for now.